Um, hello everyone, my name is Andrew Torson. I'm a principal software engineer at uh, Salesforce. And today I'm gonna talk about uh, how to customize exactly one's processing with Flink if you are running some large scale pipelines. Um, just to give you a sh short introduction about myself and the work that we do with Flink at Salesforce. So uh, I've been working with Flink for the last four years uh, first at Walmart Labs and now at uh, Salesforce. So in Salesforce, what we do with Flink is uh, log intelligence and log analytics. So as you know, that source, uh, Salesforce applications generate a lot of logs. Uh, and we run Flink jobs to analyze application performance in real time and generate alerts and uh, store some analytics in uh, offline so that uh, application performance can be analyzed later by our engineers. Um, one of the things that we wanted to achieve with Flink was exactly once processing of log lines. Um, for example, the type of analytics that we run in offline uh, require exactly once processing almost always. Uh, for example, if we want to do some, some counts and sums or even do some statistical analysis, uh, if we have at least once we'll be double counting. So exactly once is really imperative. Um, also, we run some machine learning models in offline and we don't want uh, the training sets to contain duplicates. Um, that was one of the things we discovered as we started running them. So uh, we started to explore what kind of options we have for exactly once processing with Flink. So let's see. Um, there's actually two different directions how you can achieve that. Um, so if you want a transactional support, then Flink offers what's called a two-phase commit sync function. Um, so a most well-known example of the two-phase commit sync function is Flink Kafka producer for Kafka versions .11 or higher. Um, it uh, relies on Flink checkpointing mechanism, it's tightly coupled with that. And it's basically doing a distributed transaction, which is coordinated by Flink job manager. So in the sync itself, there's two phases. Um, the first phase is called pre-commit. So for every subtask of the sync operator, uh, when the checkpoint state snapshot is captured, uh, pre-commit hook is called. Um, then the next phase is if checkpoint was successfully acknowledged uh, by a job manager after coordination, then commit hooks runs. And at this point, transaction is committed. Uh, if checkpoint was not accepted by job manager, then the transaction has to be aborted. So um, um, as you might see, Running distributed transactions is expensive. So this is not a highly performant uh, um, solution. So if you need large volumes and fire hoses, then this may not be the best option. However, this is highly customizable. So uh, what needs to be available is that the underlying store behind the sink needs to support this two-phase commit. Uh, for example, Kafka, as a Kafka brokers, they do support pre-commit and commit. So after pre-commit, the data is flushed to Kafka, but it's not visible to Kafka consumers. And only after commit is successful, then the data becomes visible. Another option is for streaming sources, and it is available in Flink as a streaming file sync. Um, so it is a lighter version of the two-phase commit, and it's more highly performant. It relies on file system APIs. So the way it works is that um, basically uh, in this sync, we are creating different buckets. Uh, and within the bucket is basically a folder that may contain many files. And each file is called a part, okay? So the parts are created dynamically and they are started and uh, finished which is configurable in the stream, streaming file sync. So underneath, uh, 
there is a partitioned recoverable writer and recoverable file system data output stream abstraction. So this is how Flink allows to customize what kind of underlying file system support is required. And default implementations are for Hadoop file system, for S3, and for local file system. So recoverable writer and recoverable file stream, data output stream, abstract away the underlying file store, all right? And as the name recoverable suggests, they need to be able to recover if link job needs to restart. Um, this streaming file sync is only loosely coupled with checkpointing. So the parts which are files within the bucket folder, they can complete independently and they will remain in pending state, which will be, uh, it means that they will be flushed to the underlying file system, but not committed. And until after the next checkpoint and after the ch next checkpoint succeeds, uh, they will move from pending state to complete state, all right? While they're in pending state, they should not be visible to any consumer who reads from the underlying file system. Um, most importantly, the way the part rolls is controlled by part rolling strategy. And there's three options there, on checkpoint, on event, and on processing time. On checkpoint means that every time there's a new checkpoint, there will be a new part created in a bucket. Uh, on event means that uh, we process new messages and depending on the data that's coming with a particular message, uh, a part role may be triggered. And the most common example would be size-based. So if, there is, if the number of records in, in a part file exceeds certain threshold, this is an event and uh, the, a new part will be created. And on processing time means that periodically parts may be rolled. Um, finally, uh, the schema that defines the uh, encoding of the messages to be written is controlled through the abstraction called part file writer. And there's two options there. One is the row wise encoding. It means that each message will be encoded as a row and we simply append new rows into a part file. It is very fast and efficient and can, can have arbitrary part completion logic. So on checkpoint, on event, on processing time, they're all supported for this. A good example would be Hadoop sequence files or other data file. Uh, the second option is a bulk format encoding. Uh, as you know, bulk formats are more difficult to work with. Uh, they are more efficient though. So, and currently Flink only supports on checkpoint part completion logic. So on event and on processing times are not available, which in my opinion, ruins the efficiency of the bulk encoding and creates a tight coupling with checkpointing. So the bulk formats examples are uh, Parquet and ORC, okay? So Parquet in particular is the most important format. It's columnar, it uses bulk encoding, and we would like to be able to save files in streaming fashion in Parquet format, all right? I'll uh, get back to the streaming file sync later. Let's first talk about two-phase commits in the function. Actually, let's actually start with the streaming file sync. I think this is the way I have it in slides. So let's talk about the abstractions. Uh, the most important one is the recoverable writer. Let's see what, uh, what kind of features it offers. Um, there's two things in there, uh, which reflects the, uh, the two stages of the, uh, of the file state. So the, uh, there is a commit recoverable, and there is a resume recoverable. So commit recoverable is metadata about a part file that will be created every time a file part is finished. Okay, we commit it. Resume recoverable is the metadata that needs to be stored about ongoing uh, part files. And we'll need to use this data if Flink job needs to recover. Um, so those two things, and are abstracted away and recoverable writer need to be able to produce them. Uh, they will be stored as part of the Flink checkpoint. So metadata about uh, ongoing and committed parts can be stored in, in the state, all right? Uh, the APIs that recoverable writer supports, first of all, it needs to be able to open a new part and the arguments is a path. So 
Once the bus is provided, it can open a new part and the result will be a recoverable stream. Uh, if it needs to recover from an existing resume recoverable, then the result will be again a recoverable stream. So it needs to know how to recover. Uh, and in particular, those are ongoing streams and maybe it needs to recover from an earlier position in a stream. That's typical, right? And finally, there is a recover for commit. So this is for pending parts, right? Uh, practically finished, but we're not committed because the checkpoint did not succeed. Um, some of those writers, they support resume. Some of them may not. This is controlled by the support resume function. So the most important part is how to recover, of course. So let's look into more details about it. Uh, so in Salesforce, we actually use S3 recoverable writer. So those files that we want to store are stored in our S3 service. So the S3 recoverable writer implementation is based on a multi-part upload feature in S3. This is actually a great feature if you don't know about it. So S3 allows the data for a particular object, uh, and usually those are large objects, so it allows the data to be incrementally sent to S3. And the data will not be visible to consumers until after the commit or abort happens at the end. So imagine a huge file, maybe a, a gigabyte. We can send the data in increments of, let's say, 10 megabytes. Uh, and once we finish all of the increments, we can say commit. And then this file, will be finalized and will be visible to S3 consumers. Or if some of the parts fail, we can abort in the middle and all of the data will be gone from S3, right? So this is a great feature and S3 Recoverable Writer uses it. Um, another implementation is Hadoop Recoverable Writer. This is an early implementation. It does not offer incremental upload uh, and it relies on truncate feature. So in order to resume from it, uh, the underlying file system uh, needs to support truncate, and not all of them do. The most important question in streaming file sync, uh, why bulk format needs to finish parts on every checkpoint? Why did Flink developers restrict uh, um, rolling strategies to be on checkpoint for bulk formats? Because obviously this is a huge restriction. Um, imagine that we are writing parquet files and uh, normally we would like them to be large. Uh, but if our checkpoint is frequent, let's say every five minutes or so, the files probably will not be large. Uh, typically we would like to use a, a size-based strategy in our part rolling, but with this uh, restriction, we cannot. The question is why. So bulk encoding typically cannot resume after recovery. Uh, because it's not possible to re-encode the data that was that needs to be reprocessed. As you know, when Flink job fails, it starts from an earlier position in the in the upstream. So some data will need to be reprocessed. And the question is, if you already processed the data and has been encoded, uh, and we got this as a as a recoverable from the stream, can we can we re-encode this? And uh, typically, the answer is no. That's what implementation of the bulk form format is. Uh, and in particular, parquet blocks, once they're encoded, they cannot be re-encoded again. So this is why uh, I think this is the main reason why bulk format needs to finish part in every checkpoint. So the part is finished, a new file will be started. Uh, if we resume, then we can just drop the ongoing part and reprocess it. So it's a very simple recovery strategy. However, certain columnar bulk encoding standards do allow incremental let's say parts to be finished while continuing writing to the same file. So typically this feature is called row groups. A good example would be parquet supports row groups. So we are writing the big parquet files, but encoding is done incrementally uh, by row groups. So we can finish encoding a particular row group and start a new one, all right? And uh, our idea was we wanted to implement an arbitrary rolling strategy for bulk form, in particular size-based strategy by completing a row group within the same part file. Whenever the API persists, is called on every checkpoint by Flink. Uh, so, 
basically, when Flink checkpoint succeeds, uh, we will be completing a row group, but we'll be continuing writing the same part file. Turns out that this is highly non-trivial. We were able to do that, but uh, it required some pretty deep customizations. So a few things that you need to know about Parquet Farm 1. It has a footer, uh, and the footer has block information, and it needs to be written at the end of the file once the file is completed. So footer is really a pain to work with in recoverable streams. So um, you basically, if you need to recover, you probably need to change the footer, all right? So it needs to be maintained, okay? And uh, Parquet Client has information that goes into the footer. It's typically metadata about the, uh, the blocks, right? Um, Parquet Client, an official implementation, I think that was uh, mostly written by Twitter, it keeps blocks info internal and private. And also all, all means of triggering to roll a new row group are also private. So I think it was intentional so that people don't mess up with the uh, with with this info, but it required a reflection hack. So we had to use a reflection hack to open up the parquet client. Finally, in uh, Flink streaming file sync, the uh, S3 recoverable serializer does not keep track of the parquet block info. So this is an additional information that we had to add to the state for the recoverable. So when we recover, we can start the parquet, we can resume basically writing to parquet file. Okay, so we uh, we had to extract the block metadata from Parquet Client and then add it to the Flink recoverable state. So when we resume, we can we can maintain the state and continue writing to the same file and write a, a legit footer when the file is finished. So this was our approach. We were able to do that with the reflection hack. So this is a reflection hack that uh, that we had to use. Um, so we had to open up a few private APIs uh, and we had to extract block metadata from the state of the Parquet client. Uh, you can see it in here, there's a, a field called blocks. Okay. So uh, extending uh, the serializer for the S3 recoverable state, so we simply add this block metadata to it. And in Parquet Client, the block metadata is stored using, uh, using Facebook uh, thrift format. So you can see some thrift code in here. Uh, it's actually relatively simple to add it to Serializer. So the code, it's, this is all the code that we needed. So again, our approach was uh, we are writing arbitrary large parquet files using streaming file sync. Um, every time flick chain point succeeds, we call persist and we flush an in-memory data from a parquet client to the underlying S3 store as a part of multi-part upload. Uh, we we uh, start a new row group and we get an updated set of block metadata info. And this is stored as part of the uh, of the recoverable. If the job needs to be recovered, we basically get the block info information and start a new Parquet client with this. And it can continue writing to this, uh, adding new row group and maintain the block sizes. And then in the end, when the file is finished, uh, a legit footer will be written containing uh, consistent information about all the row groups in this file. Okay, so um, let's talk about the transactional approach. Let's uh, have a look at the two-phase commit sync function. Um, so this is the code from Flink, okay? It's an abstraction that allows you to encode how you can run two-phase commit transactions for some of the uh, underlying data stores that support it. Uh, the most important thing is the APIs here. Uh, there's an invoke API so if we have a transaction presentation and there is a new message that came through the job, then we can invoke this and this message can be accumulated in the ongoing transaction. 
when we need to begin a new transaction, and it happens after every successful checkpoint, then we create an accumulator for this transaction. So this is a begin transaction API. Uh, once we think that transaction needs to be uh, finalized, we can call the pre-commit API. Uh, pre-commit API basically finishes the accumulation, so no new data will be added to this transaction. And it's being prepared for a commit. So commit will happen later. Uh, no new data will be added. And at this point, transaction can still be aborted. So what will happen is the, the, um, the transaction will be coordinated by a Flink job manager. And if Flink job manager rejects a checkpoint, then transaction will be aborted. If, it, uh, if the checkpoint is successful, then this transaction will have to be committed. So once this notification comes from uh, Flink job manager, then the commit API is called. At this point, the, uh, there is a request to the underlying store to commit. So all of those are abstract, and we can implement them for different data stores differently. So let's look at the details. Um, the call to commit and recover the commit are the most crucial steps. Okay, those two APIs needs to be clean. So imagine what happens if those call are blocking and Flink fails uh, while it's blocking. So this is a piece of Java doc from Flink about the, uh, these two APIs. So commit commits a pre-committed transaction. If commit method fails, then Flink application will be restarted and the recover and commit method will be called at the, at the start of the new job. Uh, user implementation must ensure that uh, recover and commit call will eventually succeed, okay? So this is the most important thing. If it doesn't succeed eventually, a data loss will occur, which is not acceptable. And transaction will be recovered in an order at which they were created. So uh, we must ensure that recover and commit if we eventually succeed, okay? So it means that we'll have to retry them and retry them and retry them until they succeed. Um, another important question is, what if the underlying data store does not support two phase commit? There's plenty of them that do not. So in Salesforce, we had to write to a variety of stores that do not. In particular, for example, we had to write to Elasticsearch, which does not support this. And they came up with the, what, what we call a lambda sync. Um, so our Lambda sync idea extends a two-phase commit sync in Flink. And the, the, the main idea is to use retrying uh, threads for commits, which are running our custom callables. And we also rely on distributed file system logs to ensure that long-running retrying transactions are exclusive. Basically, uh, we create a callable that actually does the commit, okay? Uh, we prepare this callable uh, as part of the pre-commit and once commit API is called, we start running it in a separate thread, okay? And it may be running for a long time and it will be retried, okay? So this is how we, we try to guarantee that it will eventually succeed. And while it's running, uh, Flink job continues to run, it may fail. Uh, so we need an exclusive, exclusive log and it needs to be distributed, of course, to guarantee that only one thread for a transaction runs. Okay, so I'll show you how we managed to achieve that. But basically here are the steps. Uh, we uh, use the aggregate function abstraction in Flink to accumulate elements as part of the invoke API. Uh, once the pre-commit is called, we get the aggregate result from the aggregate function and prepare a callable, okay? That will be executed uh, in a separate thread once the commit starts. And at this point, we obtain a distributed file log and we use S3, S3 objects for this. So um, we basically create a new S3 touch object and uh, basically in order to obtain a log, we, we see if the object exists or not. If not, then we obtain a log. If it's already there, then the log cannot be obtained until it's removed, okay? Uh, at the commit stage, we start running those prepared uh, callables within a separate thread. And those threads needs to be interruptible because Flink may need to shut down. And there is a retry strategy within this callable. So basically there's some, some atomic function. Let's say we send a request to uh, 
to Elasticsearch. And if request uh, fails, we'll, we'll be retrying it. And you can implement it differently. You can have an exponential back off or just, I mean, a fixed number of retries. It's, it's up to you. Uh, if the callable succeeds, we delete the log and remove the transaction from the pending obstruction list. Uh, if we need to abort, we simply interrupt the thread. We delete the log, but we keep the pending transaction. Uh, we fail Flink job and Flink will retry it next time because transaction is still pending and uh, the pending transaction metadata is saved in Flink job checkpoint. Um, we also added the expiry feature. Uh, sometimes those threads, they run for a really, really long time. And this data is, I mean, it needs to be lost, okay? So we just expire those threads and we interrupt them, okay? So this is the code, it's all the code that we have. Um, so we maintain a list of prepared transactions and running transactions. Uh, and at the pre commit, we acquire those logs and we create callables, all right? And once commit is called, we start running those callables. Uh, the most important thing is how you implement them. This is still abstract, so you can have your own implementations and we call those implementations Lambda functions. So our inspiration was we were using Amazon Lambdas to do some of this, uh, of these things. And as you know that Amazon offers exactly one processing guarantee with its Lambda. And typically you invoke Lambda on some Kinesis event. So Kinesis supports uh, two-phase commit. So that's how uh, Amazon Lambdas guarantee the exactly one's processing. So we wanted to achieve the same, but without using Amazon Lambda. So we wanted to have our own Lambda functionality in Flink. And this, this extension of two-phase commit sync allowed us to achieve the same. Uh, so the things that we used to do in Amazon Lambdas, we now do in Flink. And we still enjoy exactly one's processing guarantee. I think this is all I have. So thank you for being there. And uh, if you have any questions, yeah, I'm ready to answer them. <laughs>